Uh, welcome everyone. Um, my name is Sarah Howe. I am a poet and a trustee of the Griffin Trust. Um, and today I have the immense honour of um, speaking to Yusuf Kumanyaka, who is the recipient of this year's Lifetime Recognition Award from the Griffin Trust. Um, in appreciation and gratitude for his extraordinary body of work, um, stretching from the 70s from when he first began to write and publish um, to today with 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 this volume, um, Everyday Mojo Songs of Earth, which is 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 only just out, and which I I think our conversation will range around um, today. Uh, so, yes, could I could I ask you to say something a little bit about the title that you've chosen for this volume, which which collects both um, a dozen or so new poems and poems from across the last 20 years of your career? Well, it was, it was a title that just popped in my head and it held the aunt. Um, Mojo, of course, is um, a lucky charm, I think. And um, that's what I felt, like it was a title that brought all the poems for, from the last 20 years together. I was intrigued by by the word mojo. I also tried to look up its etymology, which seems to be clouded in some um, mystery. But I also wondered if there was a sort of little joke about it as a way of summing up a um, uh, looking back over um, a half a life's work, you know, the sense he hasn't lost his mojo. <laughs> yeah. um, but, right, also right, this, right. but also this sense, as you say, the, the charm, the talisman, the, 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 the um, aspect of magic to it, that it's the sort of um, thing that the, the witch doctor might use in the course of casting a spell, perhaps. Um, but I wanted it to con connect to the earth mm. uh, because um, it connects back to the fact that I grew up in a very small town and nature was my uh, first experiment with poetry, I think. I, I love the, the way that you talk about nature being your first experiment. I know you've, um, you've spoken in interviews in the past about the landscape around um, the woods and the fields in Louisiana where you grew up as being a bit like your first laboratory. Um, so this idea of the laboratory, the experiment, um, that sort of scientific um, metaphor. But also I was struck by the fact that they're songs of Earth. Um, rather than say from Earth or um, in Earth or on Earth, they're, they're of Earth, that they're almost made of that Earth, that soil. Um, that's right, that's right. It informs us. Uh, a ritual that one isn't really di disappointed ever. And that's what I felt, you know, just growing up there. But that's sort of in retrospect, because automatically we argue with where we come out, what we come out of for some reason. And it creates a certain kind of tension that informs the psyche, but also informs the quest. Um. I mean, talking about retrospect, I want, wanted to ask you about the experience of looking back um, and regathering, selecting from these 20 years of, of work. Um, has going through them again made you see them differently, experience them in an unexpected way, those poems? Well, I am always interested in how poems live together. And I was really surprised going back reading through and then i started arguing with myself about well suppose i i left this one out but suppose i had put it in you know that kind of thing but i do think it establishes a, a kind of emotional psychological uh, symmetry that's what i feel could you say a bit more about the, that idea of symmetry, is that to do with the way that your poems have changed and evolved in that time? Or? And also the things that I'm connected to, that I'm in, interested in, this exploration of history hmm. and how it converges 
with nature interests me a lot. Um, it's a feeling. I would like to be able to, I like to write images where I laugh and say, where did that come from? I'm surprised. So I think the surprise is still there. And, and I feel good about that. <laughs> um, were there any poems that surprised you by asking to be included? Any that you had thought might not make the cut, but that you just couldn't sort of get away from? Well, I kept going back and forth, you know. It was one of those things. And uh, finally, I just said, this is it. I came to that place. But that, that happens anyway. Um, in, in writing, when I compose a poem, often it's longer than what it ends up to be. It's a process of cutting back. And sometimes I feel like I have written past the essence from the poem. And the true essence is probably five or six lines up, that kind of thing. So it's really a process of negotiation. Hmm. Um, thinking about process, um, how do you continue to surprise yourself with your, with your poems? How do you stop process becoming rote um, and falling into habits? How do you keep it fresh? Uh, well, usually I'm working on three collections. <laughs> and I tend to go back and forth between those collections. And sometimes I come to a moment when the third one says it's time to finish. So I, so it's that kind of thing. Uh, it's a kind of dialogue with myself uh, where I have the illusion that I am surprised. <laughs> the illusion. <laughs> You know, because I'm always at work, it seems. But I do think observation and reading and what we take in is part of that process as well. Um, so you spoke just now about how you know when a poem is finished. Um, uh, I, I guess it, it seems maybe um, rather maudlin and premature to talk about um, closure in the context of a lifetime <laughs> recognition <laughs> award and I, I have faith and I'm sure that there'll be another 20 years um, selected uh, in, in due course I, I certainly hope there will be um, yes, with fingers crossed <laughs> but I, I noticed um, <laughs> late on in the book there's this line now I know why I'd rather die a poet than a warrior tattoo and tomahawk um, so conflict has reverberated through your work, but could you say something more about that juxtaposition between poet and warrior? Well, um, I was writing about Standing Bear, Chief Standing Bear, uh, because I had, I had written a libretto centered on his life. And um, coming to that place, where one, to be a poet, I think, is to, is to meditate on extended possibility. And what I mean by that is it includes everything that one has thought or experienced. And um, let's face it, for the poet, peace of mind, but also peace in the world is so important. I think it's just natural for, for the poet to think that way. Although we know that there are some poets that may be oppositional to that uh, conceit. But um, I think that's the situation with me. Um, that thinking about nature, going into the world and experiencing the small things is more, is more true to my spirit. This is what I feel. Mm. I haven't always known that. 
Um, I love the gesture um, at the end of every Mo day Mojo Songs of Earth, the way that you end with Requiem, um, which is necessarily a fragment, and the way that this collection ends on that um, gesture of interruption and that horizon of possibility, which is also, of course, to do with the impossibility of reckoning with something like um, Katrina. But could yeah. you say a little bit more about that? Why you felt you wanted to end with this dash? Um, well, I ended on that dash for, <laughs> for the strange reason that um, when Katrina, the, storm, the hurricane happened, in Louisiana. For some reason, I thought I would write a book length poem on the nature, on, on the fact that there's a disruption in the place that it involved the whole reckoning with history and i wanted it to be in a single sentence so that has been the task it's still going on the poem reckoning is still going on that's why i think it is it has that dash at the end i have many lines and spiral notebooks and what have you, because I write everything in longhand. That's part of my, um, that's how I feel. I have to, I have, I have to let the pen of the pencil touch the page and signals back to the brain, I suppose. <laughs> that's what happens. I have to say that I, I'm the same. I, it's, it's death to a poem to put it into the word processor too soon, isn't it? Um, oh yeah. <laughs> I can't imagine composing on a word processor or, or a typewriter or anything, you know, other than the pen or pencil press against the page. Well, I, I suppose there there has always been this emphasis on um the bodily, but also even the manual in your work. Um Harking back to the the fact that your father was a carpenter, um, the sense that uh, the felt embodied experience is as crucial to your work as as the more philosophical, more thought aspects of the of the poems. Um, so, is is that something that you think uh, informs the the shape of them too? Maybe. Uh, the way that you write longhand, does that feed into the forms that you create, the shapes on the page? I think so. I think so. But uh, a collection that's slightly different, uh, Talking Dirty to the Gods, came with the title. And then it gave me the feeling that I could write about anything, but it had to have at least the illusion of control, each poem did. And I was teaching at Princeton at that time. And what I would do, I would walk to work and compose, often compose the poem in my head with the line breaks and everything. And the 16 lines um, work for me in such an interesting way, that kind of compression, I think, at that moment, that was important for me. I don't know if I could write that way now. I don't think so. <laughs> um, you spoke just now of history, and I think a lot of us at the moment have this almost uncanny sense of living through history. I mean, obviously, we always are, but events recently, <laughs> at least That's in my lifetime, which is, is, is nowhere near as, as full and um, rich as yours, um, I, th there were two events in particular I wanted to ask you about, um, and forgive me if this is is painful, but what, one is um, the rioters raising the Confederate flag in the Capitol and that uh, the, mm. the shockwaves emanating from that desecration, that racist desecration. And the other is everything that's followed in the wake of George Floyd's death. Um, 
including Black Lives Matter and re more recently his murders, murderer's trial and conviction. Um, those two things, how have they affected you as a person and how have they affected you as a writer? Well, it's interesting. Um, if one has a sense of history, um, some things do not really surprise us. Um, the George Floyd incident. There are numerous similar occasions, moments. Uh, what happened on January 6th was truly a surprise in a different way because um, I sort of sense that certain people had this feeling about privilege. Um, and sometimes one has to be able to place oneself in the other's skin, even to the extent of going that strange direction as well. So I, would, I wasn't really totally surprised by it, but yet when it happened, it was real a real psychological joke. What does that have to do with democracy? Does that action as such, you know? What was that really about? I know it has a lot to do with technology, how we communicate with each other as well, and how certain things can be kept alive in the, in the national psyche. Um, I have a question um, just the problems of technology, and yet here it is. We all have to live with it. Look at the situation right now, right? We are here communicating. Is it is almost like magic, isn't it? <laughs> uh, when it works. <laughs> when it works. When it works, you know. So there are there are good and bad about so many things in our lives that we have very little control over. So I feel like everyday citizens are part of Big Brother without even re realizing it. When Orwell wrote the book, I think he first um, titled it um, uh, 1948, <laughs> right? And uh, so we have, we've gone past uh, 1984 to 2021, and here it is, Big Brother <laughs> facing us. Um, could I pick up on that metaphor of uh, putting yourself into someone else's skin? Um, yes. It feels to me like this idea of imaginative extension into the other or empathetic imagination we might call it has always been pretty central to your to your work as a poet so your work with personae and characters in particular the fact that you will write a poem that imagines not just um the the, the voice of the poem into the into the mind and world of an american gi in vietnam but also into the world of the vietnamese sex worker who um, yeah. meets by night, that, that, that those two viewpoints sit together in a piece like that. Um, yeah, what is the, the, the place of empathy and empathetic imagination for you? For me, I've sort of discovered that it's meditation. Being able to live with silence for a moment and feel that place whatever it is. And sometimes, of course, it's an argument. 
is an argument with oneself. Um, and also flesh arguing with mind. The real everyday experiences alongside abstractions. It's a it's an interesting dialogue. I I can see myself almost as a monk. I hate to say that <laughs> at this time, but there was a moment where I said, "Well, I thought about such venture." I don't know why. Um, can I ask you now about what I might call the internationalism of your work? Um, of course, the Griffin Prize and this recognition award, um, the Griffin is very much an international poetry award and your poems are read and, and loved uh, around the world. Um, uh, so we've touched on the way that your poems have reckoned with the American presence in Vietnam and that they're among the most yes, significant yes. Um, documents on, on that war that, that exist in, in, in American culture, um, I think. Um, uh, but you've also, apart from those years, held residencies around the world and those places and those cultures have also made their way into your work. Um, so I think your poems are very American but for you, what makes them American, but also what makes them not American? What makes them go beyond the national? Um, is it something to do with the cosmopolitanism of your influences? What is it? It's hard to travel to a place and not take in elements, especially when you think about the people, you think about nature. It's hard to, even when we are not aware of it, it is happening. We are ingesting certain elements of where we are. I think it's human. And I think it always has been that way, not for adventure, but for something that keeps us that keeps us whole, complete. Um, and yet, I can exist within a space as I have been for the last year and not leave and feel quite at home. Um, I like, I like to hear the voices of people, different languages and, and all that, you know, and get myself lost and then find myself again in that space as I have gotten lost quite a few times traveling. <laughs> is, is getting lost another way of surprising yourself. Um, do, you, do you find your, yourself trying to open up the poems to accident, to things that go beyond control? Well, sometimes it only takes a single image, and especially with that. I have a feeling that with poetry especially, um, images are, um, they are, they, they surprise us and we are not even aware. We have taken those images in and the image is still doing its work when we are asleep. So I think maybe that's the reason that we write poetry, right? <laughs> that we feel that or sense that. Um, so we are surprised. Um, that's, that's, that's lovely. I mean, um, Freud understood that well, didn't he? But um, the work yes. that we do as poets, even when we're, when we're asleep, um, and, and indeed not writing poems, just, just living, is living is a way of writing them by other means. Listen. Yes. Um, 
in our email exchange leading up to this interview, you mentioned that you've um, been recently working on uh, the, the the text, the story for a, for a comic book, um, which is uh, which has just premiered um, at the Tribeca Film Festival. I know that you've you've long written in forms outside poetry. You've written performance pieces. You've written libretti. Um, uh, what do these forays out of poetry bring to your poetics? Well, for Jupiter Invincible, I I didn't realize it, but I stayed very close to poetry. <laughs> I didn't realize it first. <laughs> it wasn't intentional. It just happened that way. And, and that sort of surprised me. But it was all... Um, it's a case of what some have depicted as magical realism, but I see it as, as this part of the story, um, the character, that, um, that the language helped to invent and the character helped to invent the language. What was it like seeing your words translated into images, um, thinking both about the comic medium and about the film medium? Was that a strange experience for you as a writer? Um, it is, it is, I have to admit, yes. Because it was difficult for me even to go towards the idea of the comic book. And yet, when I, when I was a boy, I. I read, you know, comic books, of course, and put them aside. And before I, I knew it, the comic book sort of was in the background and other things were more in the foreground. Poetry, for instance, <laughs> was in more, more of the foreground. Um, I was surprised. Well, I like doing collaborations as well. So, I trusted um, Ashley, um, Ashley A. Woods from Chicago, a young um, artist who brought a certain kind, certain tender gestures to the story. I, I felt connection to that. Ram Delavan, who came up with the idea of me writing the text for a comic book. It came outside of me. And I kept saying no. <laughs> and finally I said yes. And here's and here's the story. Um <laughs> wonderful. <laughs> I, I like the idea of that reluctance overcome. Um uh, so um visual art on the one hand, um, as an other to poetry, but, but music too, music has always been, uh, and jazz in particular, has always been central to your, to your poetics. But tell me, in your most recent work, is music and jazz, are they still as important to you as they once were? Gosh, that's an interesting question. Um, <clears throat> they are not in the, jazz isn't, as in the forefront. That's what that's why I feel. Um, other forays into the imagination, breaking down little walls here and there, um, realizing the complexity of a psyche, and going along with the void. Um, but jazz, I have to admit that there's a certain kind of all, when I was very small, okay, the radio was so important to me. I'm talking about when I'm four and five, I'm, I'm making, I created lyrics. I could never sing the lyrics that were coming out of the radio. <laughs> I was screaming the lyrics for all the music I was hearing. So, um, 
that's an interesting one. Um, I do, I cannot write while music is playing. It's after I've heard maybe music for an hour or so, and I wasn't even thinking about writing. I just find myself writing. Mm, what wonderful. I, I, maybe I, I should try that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, yeah. a, a, a question which is, is also somewhat a selfish one on my part as a poet who's very much at the other end of um, her career to, to yours. Uh, um, what, what's kept you going through the whole of your career as a writer? What's kept you at it? Well, reflection, I think. Just having internalized so much and reflecting on what the journey has been. But also, I like not to propel myself out into the world as some people are, you know, they're traveling, constantly traveling this place or that place and what I feel, uh, perhaps that's necessary for them. But for myself, um, I do trust my imagination to take me to some places where I think there are gentle collisions how things touch each other to create something different, something new. Um, and speaking of something new, what's your hope for the future of poetry? That's a, that's a very interesting question. I think the page is still important. Um, I think we are going to go back to moments of severe meditation. Just out of necessity. And there isn't any topic that's taboo as long as there, there's a system of aesthetics. That's what I feel. Um, thank you, Yusuf. Um, that, that seems like an idea for for, for, for the new generations to, to run with very much. Um, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it, I leave it there. It's been an honor to speak to you today. Thank you so much for the wisdom and grace of your answers. It's been a real privilege. Thank you, thank you so much for, for your wonderful questions as well as a guide. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.